Welcome to uh, the Assembly webinar hosted by Matt Shad, founding partner of Shad Law. It's going to talk to you today about how to successfully run and launch your own law firm. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Matt Shad. Thank you so much, Matt. Looking forward to Thank this. You. Great. Um, well, it's nice to talk to you guys today, even though I can't see any of you. It's kind of a weird format, and I know we're all trying to get used to uh, this, this different way of communicating with people in the last several years. Um, so the way I do these uh, seminars or presentations is maybe a little different than some people. So I like to be interrupted. I like to know you guys are out there. I like it when you have questions and we can go uh, where you guys want to go or go off topic if you want to go off topic. So uh, feel free to type your questions in. Um, ask about other stuff and every couple minutes, like I'll just take a little pause and uh, we'll, we'll try to jump in with any questions or concerns that you have. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Great. Is it showing up? Fantastic. All right. So um, we're going to narrow the topic of uh, running and launching your firm a little bit, because that's a lot to cover at one time. And I'm gonna focus on the technology part of that, um, which seemed appropriate because Assembly is putting this on. And I, I bet that most people who uh, are familiar with Assembly or companies like Assembly um, are more interested in the technology of running a law firm than almost anything else. The other reason we're gonna focus on tech is because um, I'm terrible at HR. <laughs> I'm terrible at accounting. I'm, I'm terrible at almost every business aspect of running a law firm, except for technology and trying cases. Everything else is like an intrusion into my day. So you would not want to hear best billing practices for me, uh, best accounting practices, uh, best HR practices. Um, that would be a seminar that I don't think anybody would be interested in at all. Um, and right off the bat, I want to tell you when we're talking about technology that I very much have a love-hate relationship with technology. I love what it can do for all of us. I love how much more productive and connected it can make us. I hate how it feels like there's so many things to get done in the day that people expect you to have everything finished and respond to them at the same time. I love the way that I can work from anywhere. Like two weeks ago, I was in Puerto Rico looking at the ocean. No one knew I was gone and we were having conferences. I hate the fact that we can't take um, a vacation anymore without basically being plugged in to work. And, and I dislike it so much that every summer I leave for a month in my van and camp out west uh, just to get away from everything and, and get away from the pressures of technology. And um, I've learned if you do that, call it a sabbatical, not a vacation, and judges will not give you as much of a problem as, as they might otherwise give you. Um, let's talk about our agenda just a little bit today. We're going to kind of address the philosophy of technology in the law office, um, some of its broadest implications, like how it makes you feel, um, how I encourage people to approach it, how those choices um, define what you're going to do in your practice going forward. And then we're going to get into some of the specific technological based things that seem to drive most of the conversation for lawyers, case management software, uh, the kind of applications that you can expect to deal with, software choices you have to make, hardware choices you have to make, security, um, emerging technology, technologies that are old and have been around a long time, but um, still work and are still effective and shouldn't be grandfathered out the door just yet. Finally, we'll try to talk a little bit about something that I've been really interested in the last year, which is AI, how it's changed my practice so far. And no spoiler, it's a significant change for me and um, how I see it changing the practice for lawyers in the immediate future, in the intermediate future, and in the long-term future. Because of everything that we talk about today, 
the thing that will be the most different in three years will be AI and its effects. And it always seems to generate a lot of questions and concerns. So I uh, try to deal with that. So a little bit about my background. Um, I am not, uh, I don't have any technical expertise in anything technology related by training. I majored in ancient Greek. I had no job options after college except the seminary or law school. And I clearly was not seminary material. So I ended up as a lawyer. I was in the Army JAG Corps for about four years, stationed overseas in Panama, where um, I did uh, military justice issues and prosecution issues. I came back to where I live here in Southern Indiana, right by Louisville, Kentucky. And I started practicing with my dad, who had a single person firm, he did uh, personal injury back in the uh, late 80s is when I came. And family law, I started off with a very general kind of practice, like a lot of young lawyers do. I had my shingle up. Um, I did family law, estates, uh, some personal injury, uh, criminal, you name it, whatever walked in the door, like a lot of us. And as time went on, I began to really enjoy trial work, particularly complex trial work. Um, I got lucky, won a few. Um, luckily in my business, people seem to only remember the cases you win and they forget all the cases that you lose. One thing sort of led to another. And now here, 25 years later, all I do is personal injury. Um, it's still a small firm. Um, there's three of us. I have one other person who helps me do personal injury. And at any given time, I'll have about 60 cases I'm handling myself, um, probably a hundred PI cases for the firm. Uh, we do social security and probably have about 250 to 300 social security cases go on at any one time. And there's 13 people who work here. And it's a combination of people who are here in the office and people who are remote here um, in the area. So I think the only thing that qualifies me to talk about technology is how many mistakes I've made in the past and how much money I've probably wasted on bad technology choices and bad decisions in the past. So all of my experience is from the school of, of hard knocks. Um, and to sort of start things off, I wanna give you an anecdote uh, about my morning. I had a mediation this morning in a medical malpractice case um, it was not a very pleasant mediation. <laughs> it didn't go very well. And right before I went, um, I made the classic tech mistake, which is I didn't back up this presentation. So um, at about 7.30, when I started, was going to start finishing it off. It's corrupted. It's gone. I don't have a backup. So really full morning. Um, not much time to redo a big slide deck. And so I think what happens with technology and with lawyers is the pressure of deadlines makes you be innovative. And pressure for time, pressure for results. Um, so what I did as soon as I came back uh, was I used chat GPT and AI to completely outline the entire presentation. I had some handwritten notes from where I had rehearsed it last time fed those in it scanned them in. Um, I asked chat GPT to recreate presentation slide by slide, gave it a few prompts and asked it to, ex to expand on things. Um, then I took those headings. I moved them around and changed them as I saw fit. Um, it happened pretty, pretty quick. It gave me a full outline for the presentation based on what I had done. And I asked it to generate custom artwork and graphics for a lot of the slides that you'll see today. So that whole process took probably 90 minutes. And um, it's a great example of how, if you are using sort of the latest and greatest, or you're familiar with it as a tool, you can accomplish things that you um, never would have been able to accomplish before. So. Uh, two years ago, I could not have recovered from this as quickly, but because there's some tools out there to do it, um, it's work. The thing about technology and about 
really any kind of system that you're going to have in your office that is complicated or it's going to involve multiple people is it is really hard to change ships after you picked which departure you're going to take. And this is true whether you're talking about what kind of hardware you're using, what kind of uh, telephone system you're going to use, um, what kind of case management software you're going to use, where you're going to store your files. It is incredibly expensive to make those changes because changing your whole system will bring your staff to a standstill, basically. I mean, forget about your own personal productivity for a second, because it'll take a hit when that happens. But your staff is going to be um, super stressed out. They're going to be frustrated for weeks or months while you're making major changes. So I spend a lot of time up front trying to uh, decide which major changes we're going to have as we go forward. So, and here's my test essentially for any new major change I make in the office with technology. Is it going to help me sleep at night better? Because I remember the days, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, are either there or you remember the time, or maybe it hasn't happened yet and it's coming, but you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember that deadline and you can't go back to sleep or you know you've got a hearing and you have to travel in the morning at nine and you're going to have to get up really early to be there and, and you're nervous about it. So every technological decision that I make is, is I have one kind of criteria in mind is, is it going to help me sleep at night? And is it going to make me the kind of lawyer that I want to be in the sense that do I look organized to other people? Is my calendar okay? Are you the, do you want to be the kind of person who gets the call from the judge? And we, we've probably all had this call. You know, it's nine o'clock. Where are you? <laughs> We're in the courtroom. Everybody's here but you. And uh, I think most people have had that kind of call or something similar to it. So every decision I make is to try to um, avoid that situation, to sleep better at night. Because the, the human brain is a great, great tool for solving problems. If, if you use your brain to focus and solve problems at work, it can do amazing things. But it's not a good timekeeper. It's not a good to-do list keeper. It's not a good spreadsheet keeper. It's, it's really not what our brains are good at. So technology is trying to do all those things for us and free us to be creative. And the complications that come with it are something that I call the revenge theory of technology. Um, and that is the paradox between how much more efficient these things make you and then how much more is expected of you. So my personal experience, I'm 55 years old, 55. Um, and I started at a time when the first personal computers were just becoming prevalent um, in law. When I was a law, I was a fre freshman, first year law student in uh, 1990. And my first computer was a, a, a IBM 386 with four megabytes of RAM and a 20 megabyte hard drive. One of these slides can be bigger than the entire capacity in my computer at that time. But there was also never a time when I practiced law when computers weren't available. But that's not the way it's always been. And I've talked, uh, I would have long conversations with uh, my dad about what was it like to be a lawyer in 1970? And he would say, honestly, it was great. First of all, there was no voicemail. There was no fax machines. We didn't have a copy machine. So I didn't have a computer. I didn't know how to use a typewriter. I had a phone on my desk and a pad, and I kept my appointment on a calendar. A client would come in and see me, and I would hear what they had to say. I would say I would get back to you. 
And in a week, two weeks, I'd get back to them. Maybe I would send a letter. Pleadings would get filed. We'd walk them down to the courthouse and file them. And the pace of the profession was fundamentally different. It was less, he never worked at home. I never remember my dad bringing a file home unless there was a trial coming up and he was really nervous about it. The idea of checking email or correspondence from home would be unthinkable. There was a hard line between work and home. So um, I've never lived in that world, although I have lived in a world without email the first couple of years I did this. And the revenge theory of technology is, is that the more that is given to us, the more tools that are given to us, the more is expected of us. So um, I try to choose tools that at least let me have the, the best of both of those worlds. And probably the most important tool technologically and the biggest decision if you're starting a firm or you're, you're in charge of running a firm is what your case management software is gonna be. So um, I have had, I think six or seven different case management software type needs or, or systems during the course of my career. When, to, when I was in the army, we had DOS-based software for keeping track of uh, deadlines and um, some of the basic information about court marshals they were doing. When I got into private practice, um, there wasn't case management software. People had hard files. Everything was kept in hard files. Um, I've used Excel spreadsheets to keep track of my cases. Years ago, uh, we built a database in Microsoft Access, which was like a Windows 3.1 thing, to store little fields of information and try to keep things straight. Um, my firm switched to a commercial program called Time Matters about 20 years ago. It may even still be out there. I don't know. I haven't. Uh, luckily, they don't, they don't call me anymore, and uh, I don't get their bills. But that was the first commercial software that we used. We built our own database um, using a back end with a Microsoft server. About 10 years ago, I switched to Evernote, which is a not case software at all, but a personal, like a personal productivity device. And I had my whole firm on that for a while. Um, ultimately, all of those solutions worked for a while, but um, I found that each time I chose that, I was making a decision about the DNA of my firm. I was making a decision about how people work, not just what they do, what their tasks are, but how each individual person in the firm approaches their work. And that's what case management software does because it does almost everything um, you, could, you can do to run your practice. You guys may be familiar with the law of, of entropy. And I think um, it's one of the laws of uh, thermodynamics. I'm not sure if it's the second one or the third one, but the universe moves from order to chaos constantly. Files move from order to chaos. Your caseload moves from order to chaos. It starts simply pages of paper it gets bigger and bigger. And then before you know it, you're in a situation like I was in, you're in a seven week trial that has 3 million documents. Order to chaos. So the purpose of case management software is to keep the order, to try to keep the discipline and to try to keep bad things from happening. If I could make it uh, the, the simplest way that I could describe it, would be that it keeps bad things from happening to you. Um, we use NEOS and I've loved NEOS. I'm gonna talk about what it does as a paradigm for what all case management software does because it's the one I'm familiar with. And I feel like it's the one that I can speak to and talk about workflow and, and what it does for a firm. I want you guys to know I am, uh, I have no affili official affiliation with NEOS or assembly software at all. They don't pay me. 
Um, they, they don't give me a break on my software costs, although maybe we'll try to work that out at some point midway through, through this presentation. Um, I don't owe them anything and they don't owe me anything. Um, but I've had really good experiences with them in the past few years. Um, and there was a point in time uh, when my firm was in crisis, absolute crisis, and case management software in general, and NEOS in particular, helped us out of that crisis. And that time, which may have come for a lot of the people watching this as well, was when COVID hit. So we had a traditional office where people came in there to work, not much remote work. Um, we didn't have anything particularly remote. We had a couple of tools and I would synchronize things. We did have online file storage and used Google Docs and stuff like that. Um, but, but nothing that would allow people to really truly stay connected with each other at any time for any reason over long periods of time. And I, I remember like a lot of you probably do um, when it hit and I was actually in a deposition one day with an infectious disease expert and we were uh, talking a little bit after the deposition was done. And I said, hey doc, how, how serious is this COVID thing gonna be? How much is it really gonna impact you know, getting around and everything because I, you know, you hear a lot of different things and I don't really know what to believe. And he said, if I were you, I would change everything right now because there is going to be a time in the near future or a few weeks from now when people can't come to work. And if you're a business, you are going to have to find a way to keep your doors open and function and keep things organized and keep people connected. Um, without having them in front of you. So I took a big gulp, um, came back, did a deep dive on all the different options out there. And uh, we chose uh, to go with, with NEOS. And, and part of the reason uh, was, I, I think I'd had some experience with other software programs. I do a lot of co-counsel work with people, most of my cases come from other lawyers, a fella I worked with and did a lot of cases with. He had a program called Trial Works that was really geared towards litigation. It was a desktop version of that program. Um, so I was kind of familiar with it. I know a lot of people who do personal injury used a program called Needles, although I had never used it. So I liked that it had personal injury practice um, in its DNA, although the more I've used this program and others, I don't think it, your practice area makes that much difference. So we got on board and for the first 90 days of the COVID lockdown, we did nothing but get ourselves familiar with NEOS, port two decades of data over into it and get it set up as a template um, for trying to stay organized and connected in the future. So it did that for us. And I think that without case management software and without clients coming in, without trials, moving things, I, I have serious doubts about whether or not we, we could have survived that time. And we, we took that downtown, downtime and we tried to put it to good use by getting all of this set up. So what is case management software if you think about it? Some of you may have used it, some of you may not have used it. I made a little laundry list of what case management software does. Um, put your cases in a list. It stores all the documents in your case. It shows a running log of activity in the case, including phone calls. It gives you all the contact information for your clients, other attorneys, doctors, experts, the people who you deal with every day. It organizes and stores all your to-dos. It automatically generates tasks when one task is finished. It tracks all your emails and lets you move emails, um, lets you keep track of all the emails that everyone has sent. It calendars, schedules, and ties events and outlook to a particular case. So you can look in a case and see everything that's scheduled. It integrates with Microsoft Office 
and lets you set up forms for document generation. All of our pleadings are generally start as a, as a template within our case management software. It lets you set up customized fields to track everything. So I track how much money comes in on cases, where they come from, um, what kind of case it is by type. It generates graphs and pie charts for us so that I can see at a glance how many cases am I handling, how many is another attorney in my firm handling, how many slip and fall cases, dog bites, almost any type of information I can get to really quickly and make decisions about my caseload as a whole. It lets me text clients. It lets me see a summary of the case. It can provide a portal for clients themselves to see selected information about their case. It tracks time, it tracks case expenses, tracks medical records, generates my case closing documents. It projects settlement scenarios. It acts as my address book. It keeps track of all my intakes and every phone call that comes in with the new case. It gives me a daily reminder of what I have to do that day and what's scheduled. It basically explodes my computer when there's a statute of limitations that's coming up and there's, you know, all kinds of warnings about things like that. And it performs advanced accounting functions for me. Um, so the list of things that it doesn't do is much shorter than the list of things that it does do. So um, these are some of the AI generated bullet points uh, just so I could fill a little time and have something to look at that came up uh, very quickly when I was trying to get this ready today. So your case management software really automates all of your workflow. It updates automatically and it lets you get to all your documents. So if you are not using case management software, my strong recommendation would be do your research, um, decide what's best for you, reach out to other attorneys who you think have used that software and ask them. I get asked all the time, what, what do I think of my um, case management software? And attorneys, they'll zoom in, I'll show them how it works. Excuse me. I'm always happy to do that for anybody. I've had whole teams of people from bigger law firms than mine come down and just shadow us for a day so they could see how it was when we incorporated everything. Um, and what I realized in sort of getting there with case management software is that there's a certain, uh, I don't know how to put it, like a, a DNA to your firm and how people work. It can change from person to person because everybody works in a different way. And some people, you know, they spend most of their time in their email program. Some people spend most of their time uh, in word processing. What case management software does is everyone goes to the same place. And so that's your, your values. And it's, I know this sounds kind of weird or esoteric, but your values as a firm, what things you value in terms of productivity, the information that you value and think is important, all of these things kind of make your case management software reflect the DNA of your office, how it is you want people to work, what it is you want them to see. I was having a beer last Friday with a good friend of mine, a guy who does what I do. And he was, he's got a, an office with probably four or five attorneys in it. He does a lot of high profile cases and he probably had more beers than we should have that day because somebody had missed a statute in his office. And in my business, that's the worst thing you can do is miss a statute date. Um, it, it cost him a lot of money. And um, I mean, a lot of money. It was a pretty big case. And I asked him how that could happen. Like, why didn't, why wasn't it put in on everybody's calendar? What, what case management software do you use that would allow that to happen? Because around here, there'd be like 10 people who get an email that the date is coming up. And he said, I don't use case management software. We just put files in a directory and we have an outlook calendar. 
And you know, no system means no accountability. And the more people you have who have to work on a team, the more important that is. So I think I'll take a pause because I'm going to move on from uh, case management software. Are there any questions out there that uh, any, any other directions or anything? I don't see questions in the Q&A. And if anybody has any questions, please just add them and we can address them. Cool. All right, let's talk about document storage. Um, traditionally, offices have stored their documents on a server located somewhere in a closet in their firm, or maybe a server room where you walk in and there's wires everywhere and it's about 120 degrees. We move to cloud storage, and that is the inevitable that's inevitable for all of us, whether you're a holdout or not, at some point you will be using cloud-based storage, whether it's Dropbox, whether it's hosted online storage. Um, that's a decision that people you know, need to make right now. We went to the cloud and I think the cloud is the best option because first of all, servers are expensive. Like we don't have a server in our office anymore. There is no file server. Everything's online. We don't even have network cable from the computers. In fact, if, if you think about the way a lot of offices run where you have an internet connection and you're working uh, over an internet browser, it's not even a network in the classic sense. It, all, all it is is internet access for everyone individually going up to the cloud, not among each other. So... There's some real advantages to that. Um, I, I think the cost is one, updating servers and keeping them compatible across all the computers in your office, those platforms is really time consuming. Servers break, they need maintained. Um, you're gonna need IT people to do that. Um, you don't need a lot of IT support if you got documents in the cloud. I think most attorneys are sharing information in the cloud, like all of our document production, um, and not just me, but everyone I know of and I talk to, no one sends hard documents anymore. They're all through a share file link or um, you know, some type of hosted service like Dropbox or something like that. So there's real advantages to that. It's not that expensive. It's way less expensive than filing cabinets are and it's way less expensive than storage spaces, um, especially if you have a flood or something like that, which we've had, and uh, you lose 30 years worth of documents because of a, a physical problem. A friend of mine who I've worked with. Sorry, Matt, uh, we have a question. Uh, are you out sure. any legal activities or labor? If so, what, why, and how? And how does that work with your CMS? So give, give me the first part of that again. I didn't catch that first part. Are you outsourcing any legal activities or labor? Um, not really. We used to. Um, when I think of outsourcing, I think of what, when people say that, I think that I'm paying other legal professionals to do work that I would normally do in my office. Um, and I used to do that. I used to outsource like some uh, medical record summaries and things like that. We don't really do that uh, anymore. But most of what I, I do a lot of collaboration with other lawyers. So I'm working with other lawyers and their staffs on cases um, quite a bit. So we share online storage in cases and have to communicate like, uh, like that. So I don't do a lot of outsourcing uh, in the traditional sense. I've experimented with um, offsite or out of country paralegal services um, and paying people to do that. Um, I've experimented with uh, office receptionists as a, as a third party service. Um, so there, there have been things over the years that I've outsourced. Um, but 
we don't do that anymore. And that, that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about why I haven't. I think the answer is that we're efficient enough now that we don't have to do that. Because whenever you outsource, you must train and you have to spend time getting things the way you want it. And that was such an inefficient and unsatisfying process for us in the past that I don't really do that anymore. So any other follow-up on that? I don't see any. Okay, great. So cloud-based storage is here. It is more secure in the modern era than a server-based storage. Hackers and people with malicious malware problems, they, uh, they love nothing more than your data on a server. It's the easiest thing to get into. It's way easier for them to get into that than it is your data in the cloud, paradoxically. Um, there was a local hospital here who was basically ground to a halt for third, not just a local hospital, a large chain. They had like 10 or 12 hospitals in the, in the Louisville Southeast area here. All their data was on a server. Um, they got hijacked and it brought them to a halt. So server intrusions are one of the greatest security risks that, that we have. So if you have a big room like this with servers like this, um, I'm here to tell you, I think that there's a better way and a more, more secure way to do that. Let's talk about software solutions for a little bit. Um, and, and software for lawyers is a more interesting topic than it used to be um, because it seems like, well, excuse me, less interesting. There are fewer options for traditional business software than there ever have been. Most lawyers came up on WordPerfect. WordPerfect was the de facto standard for word processing. And I don't even know if they make WordPerfect anymore. Microsoft Office has almost a monopoly on office suites with some competition from free services uh, like Gmail. And there may be some other solutions out there, but if there are, you don't see them very much. So if you're considering what kind of software you're gonna need for your office, um, probably you're gonna be using Microsoft Office. And I wish I had a lot of um, you know, alternatives for you, um, but I don't. I, there's, there's not a lot out there other than that. Um, the good news is it gets easier and easier to use and it crosses platforms and your insured compatibility with almost everybody else you do business with. You're gonna have to buy uh, some Adobe licenses because um, PDFs are the de facto standard in the legal profession and you have to be able to manipulate it. Um, and many people, depending on the size of their organization, they're going to need some sort of a communication um, or team building platform to sort of tie all this together. I know I've used Slack before, like when COVID started, we all got on Slack and I, I loved it. It was felt kind of informal, like a, a Facebook shared post between all of us and we put up files and share them. We ultimately moved to Microsoft Teams, which is just as efficient. It's just a little more corporate. You know, it's not much fun. I don't think anybody would ever look at a Microsoft product and say, you know, that's fun. I love PowerPoint, it really brings out my creativity, but, but it does the job. Um, the, I'm gonna go to this one first. Software and the future of software is browser-based software. Um, more and more programs and, and solutions are gonna be just in a web browser. And there's, that's good and bad. Like I like the desktop versions of software. I like my desktop Word, um, my desktop version of uh, Outlook, um, but they're not gonna last much longer. And I was on a conference call with some IT people talking about um, the future of Microsoft. And Microsoft has put out press releases saying they're gonna discontinue their desktop versions of programs within like two years. <laughs> so in the very near future, I think almost everything we do is gonna be in a web browser. 
And that's already the way the case management software has gone. There's, there's some legacy programs that you install and you keep updated, uh, but they're getting more and more rare and support for them is dropping um, more and more quickly. What this means is, is that the bandwidth and reliability of your internet connection at work is more important than it ever has been. And you have to take special care to really weigh what plans and maybe get a, a broadband, not just a, you know, like a, a regular plan that you'd have at your house, but you, you're going to need more bandwidth, especially with video conferencing. Um, so in a couple of years from now, if we do this presentation, probably not going to have hard copies of programs or at least that many of them on your, on your desktop. The good news is, is that it doesn't take much hardware to run a server-based program. You don't have to update it and it rarely crashes unless your um, browser itself crashes and you have a lot of um, choices with browsers. Operating environment is an important decision. I use an Apple environment. Um, I changed about 10 years ago. I had used a PC my whole life. Um, I just liked the simplicity and creativity of the Mac OS. And I never really looked back after that. Um, it, it was rare in the past for law firms to use a Mac. There just wasn't software written for it. Um, it felt foreign. There's a the more corporate your environment, the bigger your firm, the less likely that they would have like an ethos that kind of squared up with the Mac ethos. I don't think that's true anymore. And given that most software programs are going to be subscription based and they're in the cloud and you're on them on a browser, I don't think it makes a lot of difference anymore whether you pick a Mac or a PC. I think it's a personal preference. Um, in my experience, and we've had PCs and Macs and a mixed environment here. I have tried to move most of our staff to, um, to Mac and without exception, they have thanked me for it and said that they liked it better. The only, uh, sort of the only exception to that has been there are some legacy programs and some accounting programs and things like that that just don't play very well with PC or don't make desktop versions, but they're also gonna be, uh, we're just gonna see less and less of, of those kinds of uh, platforms for programs. Security and privacy. Whenever I talk about data and online data, or I talk about AI or any other things to groups of lawyers, I get the same question that comes up every single time. Is it okay? How does this take into account um, client confidentiality, client privacy? You know, is it safe? And without getting too technical, I'll tell you this. It is safe. It is as safe as having documents on a shelf where anybody can get them. There are protocols in both the United States and the EU for encryption data that basically makes it impossible for people to intercept information you give on AI or cloud-based computing or storing documents in the cloud. I still get some really fogey stogey traditionalists who want to raise those privacy concerns. And, you know, the fact is, is that encryption protocols are generally completely safe. I have never heard even a cautionary tale of anyone's information being intercepted or hijacked somehow or eavesdropped upon um, unless someone does something silly and gives a scammer your password. And if you give somebody your password, it's like giving them the keys to your safe and you're not protected anyway. But the, the data encryption technology that we have right now is enough that we all do online banking, we all pay our bills online, we all move th money. If it's good enough for me to move my money around online, then it's strong enough to store my files in. And so while this is a concern that comes up and I don't wanna poo poo it, it, it's a valid concern for people to have, there is simply not a security problem or an ethical problem with storing client data online or in the cloud. Um, 
and there's no ethics opinions that make that a problem uh, to any greater extent than someone who was sloppy and left files around or had them sitting on a restaurant or something like that. Zoom and video conferencing um, have become a huge part of uh, what we do every day. So obviously you're on this, so you use Zoom. Zoom is just gonna become more and more prevalent. We're gonna have fewer and fewer real hearings. I've had like five hearings this week already and they're all virtual, which is great because I don't have to drive over and find a parking space and do all the things I used to do and wait during the cattle call you know, for my case to be heard. On the other hand, we all are suffering from lack of social relationships with other attorneys, lack of face time with judge, judges, lack of the ability to work on your um, interpersonal skills or to think on your feet in hearings. But Zoom is here and it's here to stay. And so as a technological practice pointer, um, what, what I see the mistake that people make with Zoom is, is they have a really bad cameras and really bad sound, and they don't do anything to try to make those things better. And so they look bad, and they, they look bad to the judge, um, they look bad to opposing counsel. Um, I think the other factor with uh, some of the cool things I'm seeing with, with Zoom and technology is uh, I visited a firm um, last week for depositions, actually in-person depositions, and they had a Zoom room. It was really cool. Like it was set up for Zoom because we do so much on Zoom that they wanted their people who were participating by Zoom to look good and for it to work right. There were like speakers in the wall so you could hear stuff everywhere. There was a great big screen and they spent five or $600 on a really nice video camera. And I have to tell you, if you've ever really invested in your Zoom experience, um, you'll find that it's worth it. Document generation. We use forms all the time and um, it's a huge part of what we do. There used to be a lot of standalone document generation programs, but the truth these days is most of that is going to come from your case management software. The standalone document generation from forms or mail merges are probably not something you're gonna see that much. So we use our case management software to draft almost every document that we do. That's gonna become more and more prevalent until AI and chat GPT are so good that they draw from your own database of documents to craft new documents on the fly without using forms at all, which is something that um, we've been doing extensively for letters and even pleadings. And it, it works great. I'll kind of get to that maybe at the end. Keep track of your subscription costs. Every subscription to software that you have, you should create a little folder in your browser bar and call it subscriptions or reoccurring expenses. Make sure you know where all of them are or you will have the experience that I had the other day, which is the credit card company calls and they, they deny a charge because it's a $6,000 charge from Adobe. And I, my first reaction to my office manager is, there's no way we're paying $6,000 a year to Adobe uh, for Adobe Office Suite. It can't possibly be that expensive. And in fact, it is. <laughs> so subscription costs or something, they will creep up on you and they will bleed you dry if you don't have a really good handle on them. And as an accounting practice or and a tech practice in your firm, we have a classification financially for reoccurring charges. So you know exactly what they are because once you sign up, it's like you can never get off. So um, that is how software will be sold uh, in the future. You won't buy a license and have it be good forever. So I encourage you to have somebody keep track of that. Online and digital marketing um, is the way most people find their attorneys now. No one uses phone books anymore. So you're going to need a web page if you don't have one. And 80% of all people who find their lawyer do it on a phone. 
not their computer. So we run our own web page uh, through a site called Squarespace. It's pretty easy to set up. You put a little time in on the front end or hire somebody to do it. Um, but your online, your online presence is important. I've got a few other topics before AI. I'm going to get through them really quickly because we're going fast. The collaborative environment refers to using a program like Teams or Slack that helps you communicate. If you have more than five people in your office um, or, or the same number of people who are remote, you should consider collaborative environment software. It also helps you be gone from the office more, and it's a different way of communicating than email chains, which are not the most efficient way of doing it. So if you haven't used those programs before, you should give them a try. I'm not an expert on phone systems, except to say I do not like voice over IP, but there's nothing I can do about it. Calls aren't as good as they used to be. Uh, they don't sound as good. You can spend a lot of money on phone systems. I think 80% of the lawyers I know, they need it to sound good when they call and they need to be able to conference call a three-way call in, which seems to be the most daunting technological task that any of us have. I can use AI to create this slide deck in 90 minutes, but I cannot get four people on a telephone call with a judge watching me. So um, maybe one day they'll figure out a really easy way of doing that. Everyone in my office has a uh, Fujitsu scan snap on their desk because we scan everything in and productivity studies show that every time one of your employees gets up from their desk, you're going to lose at least half or twice the somewhere between half and twice the amount of time that they're up because they have to get back on task. So I, I try to set up our office space so that everyone has a printer and everything they need without getting up from their desk right there. Hardware and workstations, you sort of touched on it a little bit before. Um, th there used to be a, a principle in technology that the computing power of technology doubled every 18 months that is really no longer the case. The prevalence of online and, and, and internet-based stuff um, has made that less important. And they're putting less storage in computers now than they did five years ago. Like, it's really hard to buy a computer that has more than a terabyte of data in it um, because so many people are storing things online that it's less important. Less paper or paper huh? less. Yes. Just a question. Someone asked, what brand scanner did you say that you have at your desks? Um, it's called the Fujitsu, and the model is the ScanSnap. So um, we've been using those as they, and you know, they change as new versions come out, but they're really small. Like I'll show you. This is the ScanSnap right here. So it's about the size of a small laser printer and you can just scan stuff in from your desk. Makes it, makes it pretty convenient. Because most of us are gonna be uh, paperless. Um, although I think it's, there's some things about paper, you know, human memory, the way we remember things is tied to geographical locations. So trying to remember things by having them online without paper is really, really hard for the human brain. The, the way we, it's an interesting thing I was reading about the other day, human memory evolved before language did. And we evolved a good memory so we could find food, stay away from danger and find our way back to home. All of those things highlighted the need for geographic men, uh, memory. When we look at documents, we remember things because they are in a particular place on the printed page and that helps us remember it's much harder to do that when it's like online. That being said, um, we're paperless. I have a few files for when I go to a hearing or something like that, but I think most people are going to be doing it. So Pat, the future. Sorry to interrupt. We just have a couple other questions. Uh, sure. Would you change anything you are doing if you had a hundred plus staff? Yeah, I would, I would probably quit the practice of law and stay in my van full time if I had 100 staff. But first thing I would think of, 
the programs you select have to be scalable a lot of people. And so I would be even more inclined to go to browser-based versions of software because that means you're not updating those programs. I'm not sure what the individual, I, I still, even with that many people, I would not have a server. I would not keep my documents on a server. I would try to keep them in the cloud. And I would, I would try to enforce some basic document naming conventions. Like uh, as we've moved from system to system, one of the things that's let us do that like every five or seven years or 10 years, as it may happen, is that we have consistently named our documents across practice areas and across attorneys the same. So um, I would, uh, if I had that many people, I would try to standardize that even a little more. And I don't think there's any way to exist that large without case management software and collective memory. So um and one last question yeah although pcs are leading less storage i'm finding they need more operating memory to support all the cloud needs have you encountered that yeah um so i think what the uh, the question here is talking about is ram it's referred to as random access memory it's one of the specifications in a computer it is the amount of information that it can juggle at one time, not that it stores, but that it accesses in real time. And it's sort of the human brain equivalent of multitasking with short-term memory. So they, like I've learned, despite what Apple may say, eight, eight gigs is not enough <laughs> short-term memory. Um, you can get very significant performance gains from relatively modest increases in the amount of RAM on a computer, and it will extend a computer's life. So whatever it comes with, like right now, I would not want to have a computer that has less than 16 gigs of RAM. Um, and most, most computers now too, you can't upgrade the RAM. They have a, a closed motherboard. So it's not like the old days when you could plug things in. So if you don't get it up front, you're probably out of luck at the back end. So a word real quick about spatial computing. The hype is real. These things are amazing. It will be a ground changing product for all of us. Now, as a social, as a social, you know, barrier, uh, they've got some work to do to make these interactive. As a productivity tool, and user experience, the Apple Vision Pro, and what I, I think there's some similar you know, products like that for games. It is an amazing experience and um, that will only get better. I can put these on and have three screens that are as big as drive-in theater screens with a backdrop of a desert and be completely isolated from the world around me and amazingly productive. Um, like it is the most remarkable change in paradigm and experience that I've experienced in technology since the, the iPhone or the handheld phone. So they're a little heavy now, they're expensive. In a couple of years, there will just be a pair of glasses and it will be the first thing to really change the way that we interface with our um, our computer hardware, because we've been typing on on keyboards and using mice with a screen for 30 years. It really hasn't changed that much. But with voice and spatial computing in the next five years, we will be changing the way that we interface with um, computers uh, pretty dramatically. So I've taken too long and we're almost to the end and we're just now getting to AI, which I always seem to do. This is a black swan event and that is an unexpected paradigm shift that comes up on people without warning that kind of changes the world. And that's what's happened with AI. Because 18 months ago, nobody knew what ChatGPT was. Like 
let alone used it. And I can tell you that ChatGPT has completely changed how I work every single day. I use it for everything. Like it, it's, it, there's almost nothing that you can't do with it if you are not creative and willing to kind of look into it. We could spend hours just talking about chat GPT and AI tools. So in the context of tech, here's what you need to know. What you need to know is you have to spend some time learning how to use this. It is an investment of your time. Because if you, in, in my view, if you as a lawyer or your staff as a firm do not learn how to become familiar with chat GPT and other AI language models, you will be putting yourself at a tremendous, tremendous competitive disadvantage with other people. And the smaller your firm, the more nimble you can be with this. I feel like, you know, I'm in a small firm. I feel like I have a incredible advantage right now with how quickly I can do things that used to take me a ton of time. I can have a case that I don't know anything about. Like I had a school bullying case come in the other day and um, I've had one or two of those, you know, in my career, but it's a whole different practice area. I don't have any discovery for it. No forms for that. I had a conversation with chat GPT that lasted about 15 minutes. And at the end of that 15 minutes, I had a fully formed set of interrogatories to send a fully fleshed out request for production of documents, a list of every national and state standard that I think applied to bullying cases, uh, along with links to those standards. I had a list of experts in a geographic area of, of where I am. I had textbooks and tree access to it and um, fully fleshed out memos on the psychology and common practices of how schools combat bullying. That's going from zero to that in a very short amount of time. So, and I teach a whole other kind of seminar thing on how to use AI. And all I can tell you is, is that it's groundbreaking and you need to get on it now because it will replace entire categories of people in the next two or three years. Um, it has changed legal research. Um, you know, there's two major players in legal research that I think most lawyers are familiar with. They're both incorporating AI um, and they are both behind this company, which somehow snuck up on everybody and had a free, got free kind of public pro bono type model for providing legal research and leverage that into what I now think is the most powerful um, AI platform for lawyers that could possibly exist. This gives me the ability to upload a 1200 page document and have it summarized for me, like medical records, deposition transcripts, things that it took staff days to do can now be done in a matter of minutes. Um, and you, you can look this, I think they just got bought by Thomson Reuters and, uh, you know, so they'll, they'll probably mess it up um, at some point, but it's not that expensive compared to other things. And if Thomson Reuters owns assembly, I'm sorry for that shy across the bow. I don't think they do. <laughs> but- Yeah, they don't own assembly. Okay, no, right. I, so- we Sorry, Matt, can you, you said that you're a part of the NEOS AI beta. Maybe you can speak yeah. a little bit about that so, because we are rolling out that functionality. Okay. So what you're going to see is AI built into almost every um, legal product that there is. And uh, I got into the beta testing program for NEOS AI. And uh, I'm always interested to see how products are going to utilize it. Um, and it's been really cool to watch it develop. So in all of our case management software stuff, we have a lot of information about the case. There's summaries of the case. There's um, 
you know, uh, caption data, council data, stuff like that. Um, the, the way that NEOS has approached AI is they want to use it primarily right now for document generation, like smart document generation. So um, it has the ability to read all the information across all the different places in a case where you might keep it and write a demand letter for you. And it's pretty good. Like it gives you a, a, a template and you just kind of use AI to select what sections of the letter. It'll create a short injury summary, um, a liability summary, um, a damages summary, things like that. And so they're using the probably chat GPT underneath the hood to synthesize and restate information that's in all the nooks and crannies where your case management software is. And that's just one application of it. There's also, you can do a case memo or a summary judgment type brief. And because AI specializes in language, you can adjust the tone and sort of the writing style of these different things. Like de the demands are kind of, in, I wouldn't call them informal, but it's different than a pleading. But when you take that same information and you ask it to do a pleading, you get different kinds of language in it. And it generates the language that you need without having to have necessarily a form uh, built in with all the tweaking. Um, and I think that where this technology is going, um, it, and I, I can't speak for, for NEOS, but I have a feeling, I, I know like kind of what the next logical step is. Most case management software programs have the documents stored in an online file storage system associated with that case. Most commonly Microsoft SharePoint because Microsoft sort of the business standard for security and accessibility and tweakability with storing stuff. We are not that far away from a time, I think we're 12 months away, maybe less, where all of the information in those documents, whether it's a PDF, whether it's a Word document, everything in your hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of documents in your firm, that all is something that AI can access to make new things for you. So um, I have a feeling that through case management software, you're gonna say, please, it'll be like a prompt, like a conversation with a paralegal who knows everything about every case that you have and ever have had. And you'll say, in this case, using these documents, create a medical summary for me, summarize every deposition. And I think that's the direction that this technology is going in. And it will create a complaint or a pleading for you based on uh, not just stuff that's on the internet, but the actual information that's in your file. So um, although, although this technology is in sort of its infancy with case management software, it's gonna have a very significant impact not just in document generation, but I see this going in some other really interesting places as well. Sending automatic updates to clients, um, auto-populating summary fields. So if you have an accident report and deposition testimony, we're not that far away from a little area called liability summary being automatically populated and updated. Same with things like injuries. So, um, I've seen the beginnings of that um, with, with NEOS. I would assume that other places are probably behind the curve with that, uh, but that we'll live in a world where we all can have a conversation with our computers about what's in our case file and ask it to summarize, ask it to write, ask it what are the insurance limits in this case, and it'll just give you an answer. So instead of you going someplace to find it because it's been input, that will just be a question that you ask and it gives you an answer back. So we use voice to text with AI extensively. Um, we have a consent form. Clients let us uh, record, transcribe, summarize, and have access to information via voice, which means that we no longer even take notes in initial client. 
appointments, it's all done for us. And I use that all the time. That's a program called Otter AI. It's just, just something to kind of prompt you to go check it out if you're interested in that. We've talked about the future of this a little bit a, a few moments ago. Um, it will be a complete game changer for people. And if I don't mean to sound like an alarmist or a, you know, a, a Luddite or anything else like that, but you need to think of your ability to use AI as a skill that must be explored and developed. Because if you don't, other people will have a tremendous advantage over you and be more uh, productive and have better access to information. So I encourage people to think of it like that. Start off using it for personal stuff, and uh, which I do all the time, like product reviews or, you know, give me every campground within 100 miles of Durango, Colorado, on a river, in a uh, national forest that has a hiking trailhead in the campground, and I'll get a list. So it's, it's an amazing tool that cuts out a lot of research. I have been going for one hour eight minutes, 32 seconds. I am over time. I apologize. Um, I would be more than happy to take any questions or stay on for as long as anybody needs me. You can feel free to email me. I've got my email up there if you want it. Um, I enjoy talking about this stuff. Um, and I like getting ideas from other people about how they're using things because I'm wrong all the time. Ask anybody who knows me. And I'm happy to hear how other people are doing it and trying to get their feedback too. So I'm all ears if you guys have questions or you can email me later if that's more convenient for you. I don't, pardon me, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I will include Matt's email in the link or in the email that we send as a thank you along with the recording of this presentation for anyone who has follow-up questions. Thank you everybody for joining and I hope you have a wonderful day. And Matt, thank you. This has been amazing. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.